We live in a broken world, surrounded by broken lives, broken relationships, and broken systems. This brokenness is seen in suffering, violence, poverty, pain, and death around us. Brokenness leads us to search for a way to make life work. In contrast to this brokenness, we also see beauty, purpose, and evidence of design around us. The Bible tells us that God originally planned a world that worked perfectly, where everything and everyone fit together in harmony. God made each of us with a purpose, to worship Him and walk with Him. Life doesn't work when we ignore God and His original design for our lives. We selfishly insist on doing things our own way. The Bible calls this sin. We all sin and distort the original design. The consequence of our sin is separation from God, in this life and for all of eternity. Sin leads to a place of brokenness. We see this all around us and in our own lives as well. When we realize life is not working, we begin to look for a way out. We tend to go in many directions, trying different things to figure it out on our own. Brokenness leads to a place of realizing a need for something greater. At this point, we need a remedy, some good news. Because of His love, God did not leave us in our brokenness. Jesus, God in human flesh, came to us and lived perfectly according to God's design. Jesus came to rescue us, to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. He took our sin and shame to the cross, paying the penalty of our sin by His death. Jesus was then raised from the dead to provide the only way for us to be rescued and restored to a relationship with God. This is the good news. This is the gospel. Simply hearing this good news is not enough. We must admit our sinful brokenness and stop trusting in ourselves. We don't have the power to escape this brokenness on our own. We need to be rescued. We must ask God to forgive us, turning from sin to trust only in Jesus. This is what it means to repent and believe. Believing, we receive new life through Jesus and God turns our lives in a new direction. When God restores our relationship to Him, we begin to discover meaning and purpose in a broken world. Now we can pursue God's design in all areas of our lives. Even when we fail, we understand God's pathway to be restored, the same good news of Jesus. God's Spirit empowers us to recover His design and assures us of His presence in this life and for all of eternity. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. As you're turning there, you'll notice a little bookmark kind of thing in your worship guide. Uh, maybe you share a worship guide with your spouse or somebody else, and maybe you want to just snag one of these out of an extra worship guide in the back as you leave uh, today. But on the back is just a little simple thing, just lines there for you to put the names of people. Maybe over the last couple of weeks you've put them on your connection card so that we can pray with you about those people in your life who need a gospel conversation and need to put their faith and trust in Christ. And you're praying that God would use you to take an everyday conversation and turn it into a gospel conversation. We want to pray along with you about that. But this would just be for your records and for your keep, maybe just to put it in your Bible somewhere. Somewhere you'll see it regularly. You can pray for them. Uh, and then just kind of keep updated. And I think these are, these are things are so helpful and, and just to remind us, because even in this morning we'll sit here and think about someone who needs Jesus. Uh, and if we're not careful, it can be three or four or five or six weeks before we even, oh, I forgot I was going to try to talk to that person. Uh, but having their names and their faces before us on a regular basis can kind of remind us the Holy Spirit uses that. Uh, and then we just kind of maybe even purposely put ourselves in people's lives for, the, for that opportunity to share the gospel. This week, I was talking to a guy. Uh, and he was discussing the problems of the world. Have you talked to anybody this week about problems in the world? Like they got issues with their government or they got issues with disease. You know, it's something they've seen on the news. It's just me and Ellen that's had that conversation this week. But the rest of you have talked to some pretty optimistic folks that uh, I'd like to get to meet. So, uh, but here, here's the thing. As we were talking about, he's like, man, this world. And he goes, I don't imagine this. It's ever been as bad as it is right now. And I thought, well, you know, honestly, I'm not sure. I said, there was a time where, like, the Roman government fed Christians to lions. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, maybe, you know. I said, I know that sin and wickedness is maybe more sophisticated because we have an iPad and we have, all, you know, all technology and stuff like that. But the truth is, 
the problem with man is that we're just bad all the time. Like, I'm not sure there's really a time where you can really say this was better uh, or worse as far as civilization uh, as a whole. And he goes, man, I just don't know what the answer is. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> I said, I do. You know, I'm thinking, like, I got an answer. I said, you know, the truth is, you're right. Our world is absolutely broken. It is so messed up. It is a so problem. You know what, sir? That is not the way that God designed it. God designed us to walk with him and to worship him and to obey him and to have the best life ever in, in close fellowship with him and harmony with him and, and harmony with one another. But the problem is, is not that God has done something wrong or that God has left the globe to just fend for itself. The problem is man created the image of God, chose to sin. We departed from God's design and now live in this area of brokenness. You know what makes it even worse is that people try to fix this. Man, they think that religion will fix this. If everybody follows my religion, if everybody follows my denomination, man, if, if, if this hurts and this pain, the brokenness, it's so sad. And so I'm going to watch 84 episodes of my favorite sitcom on Netflix, and that'll fix the brokenness, won't it? But no, some of us know from experience after it's over uh, and, and we get out of that show hole that there's still brokenness. Some people turn to drugs and alcohol and overworking and vacations and all these things to try to numb the pain or fix pain. But the, the issue is, sir, that the, the world is broken. I said, now, do you go to church? Are you, 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 you part of a church? He said, oh, I'm, a, I'm Catholic. I said, okay. I said, well, I'm guessing. I've never been to Catholic service, but I'm guessing the Catholic service, they talk to you about Jesus. Yeah, yeah, they talk to you about Jesus. I said, so do you understand that the purpose for Jesus, God in flesh, coming to this earth was not to be a good example? It was not to set the standard of what it means to serve or to sacrifice. The real reason that Jesus came to earth uh, was to die on the cross be buried and rise again to prove that he was God. That's the gospel. Uh, and so that he could fix mankind's brokenness. It doesn't get fixed all at once. It doesn't get fixed for an entire city or entire country. It's each individual person has to realize they're broken because of sin. There is a solution, and it's not drugs, it's not alcohol, it's not being the CEO, it's not an eight-week-long vacation. The answer is what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross for us was buried and rose again. There must be a time in your life where you stop trying to be a good person. And I said that specifically. And the reason I said that to him specifically is because uh, typically Catholic people believe in good works. Good, that's what their church teaches. You have to be a good person, do all these things in order to earn your way into heaven. And so I was angling that for him because I knew that was probably what was in his head. This isn't going to save you. This isn't going to fix it. Trying harder, being kind, all those things are, they have their, I guess they're good, but not to fix this issue of brokenness. What you need is you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ uh, in Jesus Christ alone. And when that happens, you can recover and pursue God's original design for your life. It's not perfect because we still live in a, a broken world and we still deal with our broken flesh that the Holy Spirit now fights and battles with to help us uh, to pursue what God's best is for our life and what God's original designs for life. But I said, that is the remedy for the problem of the world. And he just got real quiet. And he goes, wow, that was so well said. And I thought to myself, I wish I could take credit for making this up. You know, so I didn't. You know, first of all, it's in the Bible. And suddenly this is someone else's uh, system, if you will, of kind of explaining uh, that. Uh, and unfortunately, I didn't, we didn't have time to kind of continue the conversation, talk about him personally. But man, I hope the next time he watches the news and go, this place is a mess. Ah, I hope the Holy Spirit will bring that conversation back up to remind him of what the real issue is. And not get distracted by all these uh, other things that we can kind of blame it on sometimes if we're not careful. Friends, that's just one example of taking an everyday conversation. I don't even remember the guy's name, okay? I'll probably never see him again. It was just a conversation I had with a total stranger and probably in three or four minutes just explain that to him. Had I had another five or six minutes, I probably could have talked to him about his 
personal decision to remove himself from brokenness uh, and to put himself into the gospel of Jesus Christ, but I didn't have that, have that opportunity. And so uh, I just give that to you as the, that example. You say, man, Pastor Matt, every week we've watched the video with the guy with the pen and the napkin, and then you get up there and you preach it, and you've got it hanging on the wall, and it's just like I'm starting to see this thing everywhere. And that's exactly what I, my desire is. You ever played Tetris before? Anybody going to be honest with me this morning? You played, you played Tetris a little bit? Yeah, I played Tetris. How do you know when you've played too much Tetris? It's, it's when you're walking through Walmart and everything reminds you of a Tetris piece. Anybody been there? I'll just admit it. Rob's laughing too hard to raise his hand. He knows what I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, and you think you're walking through and you go, oh, I could take that huge pack of paper towels and I could turn it this way and show it down this, and I could this person, and I, you know, and you're like, uh, and, and that's when you know you need a life, okay? You need, you need a new hobby. Uh, you need to put the controller down uh, and do something else because you're seeing everything through life through the lens of this game because you've been playing it for the last six weeks nonstop. So that, that happens, okay? And that's really what I desire for me and I desire for you when it comes to these three circles and ultimately, most importantly, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that when we have a conversation this afternoon with a neighbor and something comes up, whether they're hurting because of a spouse or because uh, I talked to someone this week whose who's nephew uh, died in his 30s, just tragic, you know, uh, and it's like, oh man, that's, you know, and, you know, big questions there, but we got answers because we know the gospel of Jesus Christ. We understand uh, what God's design was and why things like that happen. It's not God's fault. It's the sinfulness of man and our brokenness, and, uh, and, and you could talk with your kids uh, in the, the tomorrow because uh, they you know, tore up something at your house, and you say, like, what? You know, what's going on? And we can filter that, even that conversation through the gospel and through these three circles, and we go to work this week, and we can see everybody kind of jockeying for their thing and scrapping for their piece of the pie, uh, and we go, you know, I'm not really going to, I'm not entering into that. I'm not living like that. I'm not scrapping it out like that. That's the wrong focus for my life and man I could actually help someone that because in everywhere I go I sort of see uh, life through these circles and through kind of how I can shove it all uh, and arrange it kind of like you do when you overplay Tetris so here's the thing the first circle was God's design we talked about that a couple weeks ago last week we talked about brokenness and what that looks like and how we uh, our, our efforts to fix our own problems usually end us up in bigger problems. But this morning, uh, there is some good news. And the good news is that God made a way out of brokenness. The gospel allows us to recover and pursue God's design for our lives and, help, and, and, and then we can help others do uh, the very same thing. You know, God gets blamed for a lot of things in this world that aren't his fault. God designed the world to operate a certain way, but he also designed man with a free moral will to choose to obey God, to choose to love him and to trust him uh, and to allow him to be God or to do your own thing. And you know this as well as I do, that we've all, like sheep, gone astray. We've turned everyone into his own way. And so the Lord had to lay on him our iniquity. And so here's the deal, uh, is that there is some good news that God is not to blame for cancer. God is not to blame for death or disease. God is to be commended. God is to be praised for the gospel, for the answer, for the remedy, for the cure to man's brokenness. I want you to notice this morning four truths about the good news. Number one, God made a way out of our brokenness. God made a way out of our brokenness. Do you know, the truth is, is sometimes the way I respond when people break my things, fine. <laughs> then, you know, just, you know, you deal with it. You know, you fix it. I'm done with you kind of thing. But the reality is, is that God didn't just leave man in his sin. Now, I fixed it. It was all nice and pretty. And you messed it up. So pff, it's on you. And God just walk away from mankind. No, God loved us. God cared for us. We are his highest uh, creation and so right from the beginning even before time began God had a plan because of his foreknowledge he knew man's choice uh, and he had a plan uh, to make a way for us to recover and pursue his original design to come out of brokenness the first mention of it we find in Genesis chapter 3 in verse 15 this is when God is uh, handing out if you will the curses for sin 
And he says to Eve, you're going to have pain in childbearing. He says to Adam, you're going you're to till the ground. It's going to be hard. and The thorns are going to fight against you. You're going to sweat. And it's going to be uh, back-breaking work. It's going to be different than it was uh, in the Garden of Eden. And then he says to the serpent in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed, their, his offspring, or his idea, his plans, if you will, and between her seed. And it shall bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. Now, it sort of seems like if I was writing it, uh, I may have put it the other way, but I know I'm not trying to correct the Bible, uh, but the bigger one comes first. He's going to bruise your head. He's going to crush your head. That's like a, dead, a death blow, okay? Uh, you are going to grab a hold of his heel. You are going to bruise him a little bit. There is going to be some pain on him. You are going to kind of uh, take a swipe at him, but ultimately in doing that, all you're going to do is bite his heel. That's not a death blow. This will be a, a pain, an aggravation, a frustration. Uh, but in doing so, he's going to crush your head. Now we, you know, Adam and Eve, in some ways, I go, what? You know, like, that's all they get. That's all that they know. In fact, theologians call this the pro, proto-evangelium. It's the first mention of the gospel uh, in the Bible. Now, it's cloaked. Okay, it, not all the, the blanks are filled in. There's some, who is this going to be? In fact, I believe Eve thinks that this prophecy comes true when Cain is born, saying, this is the man child. This is the one I've received from the Lord. This is the seed that Genesis 3.15 is talking about. No, it wasn't. We know because we have more of God's revelation. We have the completed uh, canon of Scripture that God has given to us, so we know who that was. They don't exactly know that at the time. But God makes a way out of their brokenness. Even in the garden, in verse 21 of Genesis 3, he says, unto Adam and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and he clothed them. And they, they covered their nakedness. They covered their sin and shame with the fig leaves that they sewed together. But God said that's not sufficient. Man, that's a picture, uh, if there ever was, of the fact that man's efforts, man's goodness, man's trying on his own to fix this problem of brokenness. Uh, and God says, nope, that's not going to cut it. That's not gonna, the fig leaves don't work. Your efforts aren't good enough. What you need uh, is uh, you need a savior. You need uh, a covering that was made by God. And so God took an animal and he, and he killed that animal. The blood was shed symbolically of the perfect lamb of God that would one day come to take away the sins of the world. Clothing was made for Adam and Eve from that animal uh, and to cover their sin, to cover their shame. Uh, and it is for us a picture of the coming again of the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. The perfect sacrifice uh, Jesus Christ, God in flesh, who would one day come uh, and, and take care of the sins of Adam and Eve, who would take care of our sins. God made a way out of brokenness. You know the verse, don't you? In John three sixteen, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. This is the way that God made for us to escape the brokenness. In Hebrews 10 and, and verse 10, uh, we're told the book of Hebrews is, is a book written to explain to Jews why Jesus uh, is better than the Old Testament system, the priest and the, the temple and the sacrifices and the incense and all the, the old law and that sort of thing. And, and, and in that, he's, he's arguing that Jesus is better uh, than the Old Testament priest. And he says, by the which we are also sanctified through, through what? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He explains in verse 11 about the Old Testament priest. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering oft times or multiple times the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. He's like, look, think about it. In the Old Testament, the priest would stand in the temple. There was no place for him to sit because their work was never done. It was a picture uh, that their work could never be done until Jesus came to finish it. They would offer multiple sacrifices, the same sacrifices, day after day after day, never end in sight because the work of the Old Testament wasn't uh, completed in itself. Jesus Christ came to fulfill uh, the Old Testament law and to finish it. All of those were pictures. Even when people were offering those sacrifices, they offered the sacrifice, but it wasn't little Billy Lamb, uh, you know, their little pet that was taken to the temple and killed. It wasn't that lamb's blood that took away his sins. It was the faith uh, and obedience in that picture was that one day the Lamb of God would come and take away uh, their sins. And so he says in verse, uh, he says in verse uh, 
12, but this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. This is Jesus comes to earth and he lives a perfect life. He gets on the cross uh, and he sacrifices one sacrifice for all the sins at one time. It's going to last forever. And the writer of Hebrews is trying to go to great pains and links here to explain why Jesus is clearly better. And even after he's done, the Bible says, then he sits down. At the right hand of God. This, i got to be careful we're getting a different message here. But that is an awesome picture. You know, there's no, there's no recliner in the temple for the priest to take a 15-minute nap or, you know, to kind of take a break and relax. And that was on purpose because their work was never done because it was all pointing to Jesus Christ. But when Jesus Christ dies on the cross, the Bible says he ascends into heaven and he sits down, signifying that his work is finished. That his work is that even when he was on the cross, the last, one of the last things he said was, it is finished. What? Well, the, the sacrifice, the payment for our sins, it was, it was done. It was paid for. All the wrath of God was poured out on him and completed uh, all, for all of our sins. And so we see that God has made a way out of our brokenness and that this is through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. I'm not trying to be narrow-minded. I'm not trying to be anything other than just biblical and understanding the Bible says there's one way out of brokenness, and that is Jesus Christ. Number two, the gospel is simply Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. The, the gospel is simply that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and, and God raised him from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Paul says to the church at Corinth, Moreover, brethren, I declare you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also received, and herein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory that what I preached unto you, unless ye believe in vain. Here's the gospel. He says in verse 3, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, verse 4, and was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. In a nutshell, that's the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the salvation of my sins, for the salvation of your sin, for the salvation of mankind's sin. Here's one thing I don't want you to do. I don't want you to get dizzy running around the circle, okay? Uh, that can happen, especially the older you get. Uh, you can't you do less spinning in the kitchen with your kids. Uh, the older you get, you get dizzy. And, and you get, here, here's, here's what I'm afraid of, is that with all the graphics and all the things that you might get confused on what the gospel is. So let me just help you understand that really this, this right here is just a tool I'm using to take someone's conversation that I have with them and bring it right down to this. This is the most important thing. This is the gospel. This is the good news. And in one sentence, it is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the salvation of our sins. You can have a conversation with someone that's a really good person, a, a spiritual person. They, they go to church. They're a member of some church somewhere. They, they might even be a member of this church. It's possible. And you say, hey, you know, if, if you dying today and you stood before God and God said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to them? And that person responds, I, 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 can't, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. But oh, I, I believe in the Bible. Does that make someone say, is that the gospel? No. I believe in God. Well, James 2, the devils believe in God and they tremble, but they're not saved. They're not redeemed. They're not bought with the eternal blood of Jesus Christ. Well, I'm, a, I'm a good person. I go to church and I, you know, I, I believe in Jesus. Does someone's belief in a historical Jesus, that Jesus was an actual person on this planet, does that save them, automatically take them to heaven when they die? And the answer to that is no. I, I want to encourage you not to be confused by all the spiritual talk and <laughs> mumbo jumbo that gets thrown out there by different people because you can confidently take the word of God and what the gospel is and when someone responds and says well I'm a you know and they kind of go on about it uh you know I can't tell you how many times that someone has given me their explanation for why God should let them into heaven and the and the name Jesus never came up uh not Lord not Christ not Savior not Redeemer not perfect land I mean none of the names that would describe Jesus Christ not any of them came up in fact they were the main topic of the conversation as to why they should get into heaven I'm a good person I never hurt anybody I'm a great dad I really try hard at work you know I'm trying to be a good citizen all these other things 
And, and here's the deal. When people respond that way and exclude Jesus or add something to what Jesus did on the cross, you can mark it down that they are not saved. There is one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name Christ Jesus, not Jesus and Matt. Not Jesus and Baptist, not Jesus and Catholic, not Jesus and Mary. It's only Jesus. And so you don't have to be confused with where people stand when we get to this place in the conversation and we say to them, hey, what, how would you get, why should you get a spot in heaven? Why should God let you in his, his holy heaven if they answer anything but Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection for the salvation of my sins? They are not saved. I'd open up a little window for that they might be confused on how to articulate back, that back to you. But my friend, if you get saved, you know why you got saved. There's really no confusion about that. And so the gospel is simply this, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for sins. This death is important because someone had to pay the penalty for my sins. And then he was buried, and the third day he rises again from the dead. That's important. The, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is important to this. Look, truthfully, I can die for my sins. And I can die for them, and I will go to hell when I die, and my soul and my body will be in hell forever and forever and forever and forever. I, you can pay it if you want, but it's a bad payment plan. And that's why Jesus came and died in our place, took the wrath for us, so that we didn't have to. He's already experienced it all. And the resurrection is important because it proves that what he said was true. It proves that who he claimed to be was the fact. It, it proves that he was bigger than death. He was bigger than my sin. My sin didn't kill him and destroy him and banish him to hell forever like it would me if I try to tackle this thing without Jesus Christ. Resurrection is important because the Bible says he's the first one of the many that will be resurrected. If Jesus wouldn't have rose from the dead, how would I expect that I would? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the salvation uh, of my sins, for the forgiveness of my sins, to be made right again with God. That is the gospel. Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. What's the power of God's salvation? My good works, lighting candles, saying prayers, moving beads? Nope. The gospel. What's the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's it. There's one way to heaven. There's one bread of life. There's one water of life. There's one door by which the sheep enter. The highway to heaven is narrow. And the path to hell is wide. Number three, I want you to see that we just have to repent and believe the gospel in order to be saved. We just have to repent and believe the gospel. Mark 1.15 would speak to this. Repent means to change. It means to turn. Where there, there comes a point in my life where, man, I was trusting this. I was counting on this. I was believing that this would save me. But I realized through the teaching of the word of God, through someone taking an everyday conversation and turning it into a gospel conversation, I realized that faith in me, my good works, my efforts to undo my own brokenness is not going to cut it. It doesn't even come close. That I fall short of the glory of God. And so I must repent. I must turn from trusting in anything else to trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone to save me. And that's what it means to repent and to believe. Where I turn from trusting in nothing, I turn from trusting in what is wrong or false and turn only to Jesus Christ. John 3, 17 says, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. What does a person have to do in order to go to hell? Hear me. John 3 says this, nothing. The Bible says they're condemned already. We're born that way. We're born in sin. We're born uh, in brokenness. We're already condemned. So what do we have to do to get out of the broken circle into the gospel circle, back to where God, uh, we can accomplish God's design for our life? It is, uh, it is to believe on Jesus Christ. It is to repent, to turn from that, uh, and to trust in Jesus Christ. So in 1 John 5, he that has the Son has life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's why when someone says to me, 
I'm a good person. I go to church every week. They don't have the sun. They have church attendance. They have religious behavior. And what do they need to do? They need to repent from that. They need to turn from that and trust Jesus Christ alone. Friends, I grew up in church all of my life. For most of my life, I've lived, I, I was the, the closest person to the church, okay? My dad was a pastor who lived like in the, on the church property, but that doesn't save a person. I, I can't remember a time in my life where I didn't know that Jesus loved me, I, where I didn't know Romans 3.23 and, uh, and, and, and Romans 6.23 and the Romans road and that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And for the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life to Jesus Christ the Lord. I, I can't even remember my life before knowing those facts. But does that save me? No. Because what's required for salvation isn't the knowledge of facts, but is the repentance and faith in that what Jesus did was for me. That he died for me. It'd sort of be like someone going out to eat with someone and they say, hey, I'm going to pay for that. And they go up and they pay for your meal. And then you walk up 10 minutes later after they're gone and you go, I want to pay for my meal. And they go, oh, that guy already paid for it. They go, no, he didn't. I want to pay for it. And, and you refuse to accept the payment, you know, you, you might have saw them go up there. You might have saw them give the money. You might have seen them say, hey, that's on, you, you get the next one, but you go up there and just refuse to let his transaction count for you. You don't, you don't have that payment. And so he that has the Son has life, and he that hath not the Son of God does not have life. Can I ask you a question right now this morning? Do you have the Son? Man, I sure hope you do. If you don't, you can before you leave today. You could, you could leave this room not living in brokenness, but pursuing God's design for your life. And it's not because you attended church today. Uh, it's not because you've been here the last three weeks. It's not because you're Baptist or because you're Catholic, because you have some verse memorized somewhere. It's because there's a day in your life where you put your faith in Jesus alone as your Savior. That's the gospel. That's what uh, gives us eternal life when we, when we turn and put our faith in him alone. Have you done that? Do you have Jesus? If you do, you have life. And if you don't, my friend, I'm telling you this because I love you, you do not have life. You might have religion, you might have warm fuzzies, but you don't have eternal life. Number four, I want you to see God helps us recover and pursue his design for our lives. He removes the heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. He indwells us with his spirit and empowers us with his spirit. He uh, restores us to the way we were supposed to be. He reconciles us to God and repairs the brokenness so that I can now uh, recover and pursue God's original design in my life. Now, it looks different than it did for Adam and Eve before their sin. Because before their sin, there was no sin. They lived in a state of innocence. And there was perfection. And there was eternal life that they possessed because they had never committed sinful acts. But when we get saved today, the fact is, is we are made alive by the Holy Spirit, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. Uh, that we are filled with the Spirit and, that the, and the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us to uh, make us spiritually alive, to guide us into spiritual uh, truth, to produce in us spiritual fruit according uh, to, to the book of Galatians. Uh, and, and, and we have this ability now to live for God. We have this ability now to walk and to worship God, not to be a part of some uh, mechanic religion, but to have a relationship with God. And that's made possible because of the Holy Spirit. That's made possible because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Now we still battle our flesh. Anybody here perfect? No? Okay, me neither. Okay, we're all in this together. Man, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit's there. If you're saved, the flesh is still there. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit is greater as he that is in me than he that is in the world. But the world's still there. Man, the flesh is still there and we battle and we fight and we try to, we try to trust God and have faith in God and walk in the Spirit and not be drunk with wine where it's in excess, but be filled uh, with the Spirit. We try to walk after the Spirit and, and allow Him to produce His fruit in our life. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no uh, law. We try to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision 
for the flesh. But that battle is still there. The spirit and the flesh, these two are contrary to one another. Paul said, the things I want to do, I, I fail, I mess up. And the things I don't want to do, I, I do them because I'm this wretched, broken man. Who's going to deliver me? He says, man, I praise God. It's through Jesus Christ there's deliverance. Through Jesus Christ, I can recover and pursue. Through Jesus Christ, I can accomplish God's design with his help. Right now, today, I can walk and worship God. Because when I was 12 years old, I repented and believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit moved in and made me spiritually alive so that I can recover and pursue God's plan for my life. In 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Verse 17, Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He says then in verse 18, All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. That's how he did it. That's how we're over here in brokenness. God's over here with his design. But he reconciled us back to him. And it's through the gospel. It's through Jesus Christ. Uh, and in doing so, uh, and in doing so, God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Hey, a lot of us that are members, part of this church, you have a ministry, right? You serve, you've been to starting point class, and then you went to serving point class with Seth, and you uh, found that, hey, I want to be in the nursery, or I want to help with the teens, or I want to be with the music team, or I want to do this, and uh, I want to wake up the sound guy. No, I'm kidding. He's still doing good back there. Uh, and, and, and we serve in a ministry. Man, we even get an orange lanyard, and we get a car with your name on it. It's all official, uh, and it looks real sharp and all those things. But you know, there is one ministry that every one of us has been volunteered for, whether you want to or not. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, you've been given this ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation. Yeah, it's that when people are far away from God, that's how we're born. That's how we live. Uh, how, how humanity is in brokenness. And because we know the truth, because we've repented and believed, because we're spiritually alive, because we can pursue God's design in our life, God sends us back out into this world of brokenness to tell someone else, about the brokenness, but not just to say, man, this is a bad place to live, but to tell this is how you fix the brokenness. This is the answer that you're looking for. Stop looking over there. Stop looking over there. Point them to Jesus and call them to faith and repentance. He gives us the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 19, he says it this way. Uh, he says, to witness, our, we're to witness that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses upon them. Hey, you don't have to pay for this. Jesus, uh, he took your punishment for you and hath committed unto us the words of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ. And Christ has commissioned us to tell people, hey, get reconciled with God. That is not the way God, that's not the intent God had for your life when he created you. And so repent and believe the gospel so that you can recover and pursue God's original design for your life. We're new creatures, and we're now his ambassadors into a broken world. Friends, our desire for this series, for the core value that says we believe uh, in sharing with our world the gospel of Jesus Christ. Man, we want to do it however we can that doesn't violate scripture. We want to get the gospel out to as many people as we can. We want every resident of our community in our town, our city, uh, to have repeated opportunities to hear uh, and respond to the gospel. Look, uh, you, you may say, man, this church is a little busier than other churches. Man, there's a lot of, a lot of things going on. I can go to this church and I can just kind of hide in the, you know, in, the, in the pew and no one notices me. No one ever asks me to do things. I'm just in on Sunday morning, out, and I can come back next week. And I don't get like pressured to do like these evangelism classes or like serve in a ministry or help with the egg hunt or do you know these things but i want to I understand the reason that, that we do all those things the reason that we would have city groups and the reason that we would push those and we usually encourage them to reach out into their uh, neighborhoods or to reach out into their workplace or to reach out uh, in the community is because we have this ministry the ministry of reconciliation because we have this opportunity to be the mouthpiece of God to help people out of brokenness back to God's original design. I'll be honest with you this morning when I think about uh, Easter coming, I'm kind of tired of egg hunts. You know, the truth is, if I could have my choice, I'd never do one again. 
You know, if uh, the truth is, I like fall festivals and I like throwing pumpkins at stuff, but the, the, the truth is, that's a lot of work. And if I was just going to be, just do my own thing, what I feel like doing, I, I wouldn't ever do one of those. I just tell, hey, show up. If you want the Bible, you show up here on Sunday morning, I'll preach to you, we'll go home, and that'd be the end of it. But here's the thing we live in this weird, crazy mission field called the United States of America. And I don't understand it, and you probably don't either, but for whatever reason, you can put candy inside plastic, throw it in the grass, and hundreds of people will come to hunt for it. It doesn't make any sense to me. You know what? They'll actually sit in this room and listen to me talk for 45 minutes just so they can go take a picture of their kid hunting for plastic uh, in, in, the back, in the backyard, uh, and that we could actually tell them about Jesus maybe for the first time ever. And some of them even respond to Christ and get saved. We can stack a bunch of hay and throw a bunch of pumpkins and they'll come again. And we can run an event and give out donuts and someone will come by then. And we can feed lunches to the school, some people that don't have enough food for the weekends. And we can give and sacrifice and do that and build relationships for the opportunity uh, to share the gospel so that people get saved. Uh, and we'll do it again and again and again and again. However the Holy Spirit leads, we want to be there and ready with the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, building these relationships in people's lives so that we can tell them that the brokenness isn't God's fault. It's our fault. But God loved us anyways and made a way for us to get back to his original design if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So... As we live in this crazy mission field, we'll figure out whatever way we can, whatever, whoever you are that can be leveraged and figured out how to take an everyday conversation and turn it into a gospel conversation. That's what this ministry is about. This entire church is built on the ministry of reconciliation. It's not about cramming your head full of Bible knowledge. I hope that you learn more about God uh, through his word. But the, the knowledge of that is so that you'll take it out into a broken world and point someone back to God's original design for your life. We want you to be trained so that you can go and tell them. My, I've never hidden this fact. I'm preaching this message and the two before this for one purpose, for those who are saved and know Christ as your Savior this morning. It's so that you would participate in the August 7, 14, and 25th class on turning everyday conversations into gospel conversations. If you feel like you could stand before God and say, God, I don't really need any more tools. I am nailing it. I'm killing it out there with sharing the gospel and helping people come to Christ. And even if I can, you know, you can't get them saved, but I just keep presenting and I'm faithful at it. I don't really see where I could even improve on that. If, if that's you, awesome. I, then you can teach the class. I don't mind. Uh, but here's the thing. Why I'm saying that is because I think that we need this. I think that all of us need this. I need it. This has been a, this has been a help to me. I'm starting to view uh, everyday interactions with people through these three circles, like someone who's played Tetris too much rearranges the shelves in Walmart to you know, fit it into their Tetris mindset. And that's what you need. A little more practice, a little more encouragement, a little more help, a little more accountability. And I know that's kind of ner uh, nervous. Like, if I come to this class, I might actually learn how to tell somebody about Jesus, then I'll have to use it. Yeah, that's the, you know, that's the point. I mean, if I come to this class and pass from out and go, hey, did you talk about the three circles this week? Yes, I will. Yeah, I want to encourage you that. I, I want it to flow out from us. So it's not just five people sharing the gospel this week, but it's 50 or 100 or 200 because we all go to different little mission fields around this city where they need the light of the glorious gospel to shine into them, and you're the one to do it. The decision for this message for those who are saved is to participate and become excellent at taking an everyday conversation and turning it into a gospel conversation. The other point of this message is that maybe you're here right now. And the truth is, as you look at these three circles, you see that you, your spiritual life is over here in the brokenness. There's really never been a time in your life where you've Put your faith in Jesus alone. You know who Jesus is. You believe what the Bible says about him. But you're trusting in Jesus and you to get to heaven. You're trusting in your denomination and your religion to get you to heaven. And my friend, I just want you to know this. The Bible says that the only way to heaven is through the gospel all by itself. Not Jesus and something you've done. 
Not Jesus and something your parents did for you, but Jesus and Jesus alone. There needs to be a time in your life like there was in mine when I was 12 years old where I realized I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I need a Savior. I'm drowning in my sin and brokenness even as a 12-year-old, and I need a Savior. And the Bible says we need to choose the Savior, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ alone. Have you done that? If you died right now today, could you give me a Bible reason why you know for certain your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven? My friend, in just a minute, we're going to have a time of invitation. I'm going to invite you to make some decisions about what we've preached. There's going to be two decisions. One is to say, hey, I need to be there for that class. And I know, I normally, I go to the driving range on, you know, on August 7th at 7 o'clock. I don't know how I'd make it to your, that class and the driving range. I got an idea. <laughs> you, know, uh, you might have to rearrange some things in order to do it, but it should be a priority in our life. That's the, first, the second decision is maybe you're here and you know right now I'm not saved. I don't have eternal life. I don't have, uh, I'm not saved if I died. I don't know what would happen to me. I don't have any Bible reason why I'd be in heaven over hell. And I need you to pray for me. And in just a minute, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll ask you that and just ask you to slip up your hand. I wouldn't call you out and say, oh, he raised his hand. Someone grab him quick and throw him in the baptism. No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> You're gonna, you may raise your hand and I'll say, I see your hand, I'm going to pray for you. And I will. I'm not going to move from where I'm at. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. But man, I would love to know that God's speaking your heart about this so very important issue, your eternal life. And then I'm going to give you an opportunity. I will today. I'm going to step to the back and maybe you'd like to slip to the back. Say, Pastor Matt, pray for me. I'm not saved. And maybe you'd like to slip to the back even today. And men, I'll take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. Ladies, I'll have a lady take a Bible and show you how, from the Bible how you can put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I'd hate to preach a message on how to share the gospel and not give someone an opportunity to respond to the gospel even here right now.